SIA, you will automatically get the proper documentation for your certification. If you're not, you'll get an email uh, encouraging you to become a member uh, because then you'll, you'll get your documentation and, and no issue. We do have a membership table uh, over in the, the main conference hall, so that's something you might want to uh, uh, go by and check out. It's a very nominal cost, and we give away a lot of uh, scholarship money to s students uh, studying STEM from high school to college, both undergrad and grad. So thanks so much for being here. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Walt White Cotton. Uh, and Walt is a hybrid cloud subject matter expert supporting the U.S. government at Microsoft. He's a U.S. Air Force veteran and has worked in the cloud since 2012. He works with the organizations that want to build modern applications across hybrid cloud environments, balancing the right amount of flexibility and control to deploy to the location that bet best meets the U.S. government business technical and regulatory requirements. We also have uh, Mr. Joel Day with us, and Joel is a technology strategist focused on Intel community and federal accounts. He's been with Microsoft since 2011, where he started as an application development consultant, working on digitally transforming, transforming the IC. His current focuses include building cloud native applications, deploying Internet of Things solutions, bringing AI to the edge, and implementing DevSecOps. Our third uh, speaker is Mr. Nav Sagu, and Nav is an application innovation and DevOps specialist at Microsoft Federal, enabling Air Force and Space Force with their application modernization and platform journey in Microsoft Azure government clouds. In his past roles, he's worked with many uh, U.S. Air Force customers on their DevSecOps ops strategy and implementation, from helping them get started to supporting their growth as they scaled over time and to establish software factories in the DOD. NAV has been a part of and continue to support many software factories in the Air Force today. So we welcome these three speakers. I know you'll gain a lot of knowledge uh, from them. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to you all. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for coming. We've got uh, a lot of content, but we hopefully have enough time to maybe at the end of this uh, have about 10 to 15 minutes for q and I'm Walt Whitecotton. Thank you, Mary, for the introductions. Uh, Nav is here, and then Joe will follow me. So we'll kind of do some handoffs relative to moving through these slides. The agenda, essentially real quick introductions, a little talk about change associated with moving to cloud and some of the things that we're going to advocate for with DevOps, and then some of the products and the features relative to what's happening at the edge relative to this AOR, and pretty much worldwide from a commercial business. And a um, little bit of information from our CEO. The, uh, the challenge, I've been doing this for quite a while, I started ABS uh, 2012, literally 10 years ago today. Uh, we've seen a significant growth in the mix of legacy data centers, folks that have moved to public cloud, be it whatever domain. And then these environments have been essentially taking applications and spanning things from the legacy, the public cloud, and potentially to the edge. And then across this, uh, typically two characteristics cover the, the requirement for this. In traditional speak in DOD, it's latency, the tyranny of distance. In this AOR, it's very critical. And then also the domain by which you operate at, which would be unclassified, the TS. There are still to this day certain data types that cannot be moved into commercial cloud, even though they may have the accreditation for the, the data class. And so without getting into those details, we can kind of talk about that drives the discussion around building applications that span those domains as well as the, the tyranny of distance issue with the speed of light. So we need to put something close to the edge, and some of these terms are maybe Microsoft-centric, but I think more and more people realize that IP, IP enablement of the devices is driving that term intelligence, and then as more and more things become IP enabled, uh, legacy brownfield devices, man, this light is very bright. I apologize, I can hardly see the screen. Um, you think about the power that that provides, uh, like a daily commute advantage relative to your cell phone, providing you position and time and maybe offering an alternate route to save more precious time. Some other things as that becomes higher order magnitude, you start to think about things that everyone's familiar with the Tesla. The ability to make a, a car turn with an autonomous, you know, uh, intelligent system 
and making sure the confidence to make sure the vehicle turns at the appropriate time, you know, is uh, something that categorically goes wrong, very, very bad things can happen. More logic relative to what we're seeing with use cases specific to some of the tactical things that the organizations we support work on and to support mission. So that's kind of the backdrop, uh, what we're building and the tool sets uh, that have kind of coined the term intelligent cloud, intelligent edge. Um, I put down some thoughts relative to, you know, we've had some delays with a certain contract I won't mention, but it's now evolving to the joint warfighter contract that has, I think, been suspended temporarily till December. But the idea is that change associated with cloud and adopting some strategies around DevOps, in particular DevSecOps, will start to build steam. You know, I've talked to a number of folks, I see some familiar faces here, where at some point you've started your journey into the cloud, and now with what's happening with the intelligent edge growth and some of the IoT enablement and IP enablement, I think you'll start to see more and more importance relative to developing the right DevSecOps strategy. And if you think about, you know, the, just the example relative to having autonomous systems out there, getting that, you know, at scale and the speed by which some of the things happen from a mission perspective, we really need to get that right. And it's akin to like the legacy of the third offset advantage, you know, as we move into the digital offset, enabling technologies you know, are important to get right, especially with the speed, the power, and the decision cycles that are tied to more and more automation with AI and ML. Those insights are really critical. And as you can imagine, with more and more devices, IP enabled, the amount of data to sort through and to derive insights, it just becomes an increasingly complex problem as we move stuff through the generative distance as well as the data domains we operate from. Uh, having said all that, there's significant benefits as you get a model and in part the DevSecOps strategy plays a big part in that transformation. So if we do it right, the speed by which we can apply, you know, the logic with ANML, the, the outcome of that, things that are tied to what we've seen with organizations that uh, uh, moved to the cloud prior to some of the things we've lived through for the last two and a half years, the pandemic, uh, for instance, the Johns Hopkins University website that uh, tracked all the COVID cases. The inference that provided relative to as you got more serious and you know, the Delta variant worked through, tracking where to put resources and the coordination of activities with state, local, and federal you know, agencies supporting that, that information was vital and obviously it changed daily. So that, that ability to coordinate and predict things was you know, an early testament for folks that moved to the cloud and it started to use that data across the edge environments. So it really provided the other two things with tied to a better uptime and then lower cost. I think more and more folks are, you know, as you move through other things tied to automation with cloud, infrastructure as code, configuration as code, all of these types of ability or technologies and capabilities that get you to a point where you can automate, make it binary, make it prescriptive, drive the transformation discussion in a really unique way because it's declarative and then the standards that are tied to REST APIs in the cloud give you a lot of flexibility uh, as well as performance tied to the automation. In other words, speed and accuracy. And that contributes to some advanced workloads. We can talk about those maybe during a break, but the security posture, multi-cloud operations, those become a lot more difficult to, to from a threat or a cyber perspective to overcome. And a lot of that, again, tied to the staging, what we do in the cloud, a lot of the core capabilities around cyber are provided by the CSP. And then, as I kind of allude to in the 2-4, as you move through adopting a DevOps strategy, you get the benefit of you know, rapid change and all the security benefits. So it's sort of a two for there. And I'm kind of drawing it back to, you know, what does it look like, the picture in the upper left, you know, where we are from a hyperscale cloud provider or a large data center, we call that the cloud or the core, and what's happening with the advent of a lot of the OTAs that we saw happen during the, um, and still ongoing relative to uh, 5G exploration, that near edge, high performance, high latency, or excuse me, low latency kind of systems, but as you get further away from the data center's potential in the CONUS, uh, location and then out to the edge, things like drones, I mentioned kind of a smart car or something relative to the phone, the data at the far edge, you know, the ability to use some reason and logic there to derive insights is, is an area that's going to explode relative to just the number of sensors that are out there. And then uh, the discussion around, you know, applying that technology to the largest AOR on the planet, obviously we're in the Pacific this week, uh, the challenges associated with what Admiral Aquino is working with. Uh, tied to the tyranny of distance and trying to maintain, you know, application baselines, things like that from a cyber perspective and keep that advantage relative to the offset. Really important to get these things right. 
and I'm kind of bringing it back to the, the, the development perspective relative to software. And so uh, a picture relative to how do we build code once and move that through deployment cycles potentially to different environments. And the thinking there is that a lot of times apps should be factored relative to the domain they operate from. In this case, we can build an app once and essentially change the configuration based upon we where we deploy to. What I've illustrated there from the, the code, the build and deploy sections in the middle part of the slide, is where do we actually deploy it and work on it from a staging perspective. So the legacy of keeping something consistent and just changing the configuration for where we deploy is an important thing relative to the DevOps strategy, uh, relative to the speed and agility and the things that tie uh, all of this into a change to digital transformation. Um, that's basically all I have from the introduction of this, this session. Nav, I think I'm gonna transfer to you, but one thing I'll, I'll add, uh, we do have a very unique demo where we demonstrate this and kind of tied to the middle staging environment, which is a DDL environment up at our booth at 815. So if there's an interest in talking about this at a much deeper level and to work through a hands-on kind of prototype, we'd love to spend some time with you at the booth. Thank you very much. You got it. Thanks, Nat. Thank you. Thanks, Walt. Good morning, folks. How are you all doing? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, all right, wonderful. Uh, my name is Nav. I'm an app dev uh, specialist here at Microsoft. Um, and sort of give you a little bit about my background. I've had a chance to work with many organizations across the DOD, primarily the Air Force, and I've been very fortunate and blessed uh, to have been part of some of the organizations that really saw from the very beginning that there's a new way of building and delivering capabilities for the mission. You know, we all know that in the DOD, uh, particularly, it takes at least you know five to ten years to get anything new out to the warfighter at the edge. Uh, and there was, you know, there was growing frustration across, uh, you know, the DOD in terms of what can we do to change this? You know, how is it that the commercial companies are innovating so quickly? How can uh, companies like Netflix can deploy? hundreds of times a day, how can Amazon do thousands of deployments across you know, multiple teams, yet DOD is still trying to figure out how to get a simple web-based application in production in a couple of months. So things had to be radically changed in order to you know, figure out how, what do we need to do to change this paradigm where that commercial innovation, how commercial is operating and able to, you know, today, to be able to better operate and stay competitive what can we do? Because you know, DOD has certain challenges. I mean, we are seeing what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. You know, with China growing its uh, its power across the world. There is a real imp imp impediment that we have to figure out as DOD. You know, how do we respond to this change, to this growing threat across the entire organization? So, uh, you know, I am. To give you a little bit of context on how this talk is going to go, you know, Walt gave us a quick introduction of how cloud and then edge computing is becoming more and more foundational in terms of how DOD can continue to operate and deliver on that mission of being able to build something in a cloud-based environment, but at the end of the day, production is something that's running all across the globe. It has to be disconnected. It has to operate when it needs to operate without any network connectivity whatsoever back to the mainland or to some you know, giant provider like uh, Amazon or, or Microsoft Azure. So you know, the conversation that's going, to, uh, that's going to follow from here on is essentially three case studies. Uh, and these three case studies are of innovation that's been happening across the Air Force for some time now. And the reason why I picked these three case studies is because I'm personally involved uh, in many capacity, in some capacity whatsoever. 
uh, with these three uh, you know, customers and organizations, but there's plenty of other examples out there. So by no means this is a comprehensive list. I know we have some representation from AFRL, and they're, they're doing some amazing work with a lot of the organizations to support this innovation. So you know, just as an example of what I'm about to present, is just three case studies in the Air Force. How many of you have heard of an organization called Kessel Run? Nice. Um, just if, for those of you who are not very familiar, uh, Kessel Run is the, is the modern, so to speak, a way of helping AOC modernize the way they are building and delivering software for the Air Operations Center. Uh, just as a back, quick backstory, the way it got started is uh, Colonel Enrique Oti, who was at that time in charge uh, of the organization, he had made a visit out to IUD in Qatar, and he was looking at, uh, you know, and there was a couple of people from the industry, particularly a guy from Google, uh, from Google uh, was there, and they were trying to figure out, you know, what is DOD doing, how are they currently operating their mission, and they saw uh, that a couple of airmen were trying to figure out how to plan tankers for an upcoming mission, you know, so that airplanes could be refueled uh, as that mission is being executed. And they just saw the process, you know, people on a whiteboard with all these lines, scraping lines, you know, check marks, then somebody on a, a desktop, you know, with Excel file running some computation, right? And then, you know, somebody creating a PowerPoint on the side. And this is how, for the most part, we see a lot of mission is being executed. When that delegation that was visiting IUD uh, Qatar came back, they said there has to be a better way. Like, you know, this is something that can be easily done in a digital manner. What can we do to streamline this where we don't need 10 people just to figure out which tankers need to be up in the air and how do we support that for an ongoing mission across, you know, the different theaters. So that's where the journey of Kesselrun started. Uh, you know, they said, you know, let's go work with some modern uh, you know, organizations who know how to build software in modern ways, let's use digital platforms that enable developer productivity that really streamline the way you can get into production. That way, you're having to focus less on the infrastructure, you're having to focus less on the technology, and you can focus more on the mission. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters, right? DevOps is not about the tools and the technology. Yes, it's fun, it's nice. You know, as technologists, we can talk about it all day. But at the end of the day, if it's not helping meet the mission objectives, if it's not helping the transformation of an organization, then it's, you know, there's little point in you know, going down that journey and making all that investment. So that's Kessel Run. And, you know, at this point in time, they've grown from a small team of, you know, seven to eight developers who started their very first application called Tanker Planning uh, and, you know, got, you know, got things up and running, streamlined that process to now a thousand plus, you know, members within that organization, you know, 40 plus teams delivering 80 capabilities across the AOC and Qatar and rapidly expanding to the rest of the AOR. So this is an example of an organization that said we want to do something different, right? Let's, you know, let's take a little bit of risk. Let's try something different that we feel a little bit uncomfortable with, but that's the whole point. You know, we're trying to get out of our this zone of we think everything has to work in the way we imagined it to be and we don't, you know, we don't chart our new paths. Another example is an uh, organization from the Space Force, right? Uh, this is Kobayashi Maru, and particularly they have been focusing on a similar mission, but around space, you know, how to streamline and improve the way our, we are able to execute the mission. You know, space agency is relatively new, and they're trying to figure out how can we take on the innovation that's already happening and start from a much, you know, a, a much more modern platform in terms of building and delivering capabilities. Frankly enough, some of the folks who were, um, uh, some of the folks who started uh, this organization at Kobayashi Maru, uh, they actually came from Kessel Run, so they had that mindset. They had seen how software could be done in a different way, and they brought that mentality forward. And you know, lo and behold, Within a couple of months, they got their first application deployed in production using Kesselman's platform, Metroid, and you know from there onwards, it's rest, rest, you know, rest is history. Now they have seven to eight product teams delivering capabilities uh, across uh, across their ecosystem. You know, all focused around space mission, and then uh, you know that's that's how amazing that journey could be, where organizations can just start with a small idea, and as long as there is support from you know 
There is a desire to change, but at the, at the same time, there needs to be support from top-down leadership to enable that change. And as long as those two things come together, you know, wonderful things can happen. And then finally, the third use case that I'll briefly talk about is this uh, organization from the Air Force Logistics community out of uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, they named their software Factory Bestman, and it's all focused around helping airmen you know, streamline and get better capabilities out when it comes to just Air Force Logistics. So it doesn't have to be just all focused on forward admission. You know, they're taking the same, uh, they're taking the same innovation and saying, how can we apply that to the Air Force, regardless of what the actual mission is, whether it's back in office systems, you know, whether it's logistics, or it's at the very foreign, foreign uh, you know, front edge uh, warfighter mission. So, you know, when we when we talk about DevOps, there's we see some things, but there's a lot that's underneath in terms of what you don't see, but it's there, right? It's like the heartbeat when you you know we all have it, uh, but you don't see it. You can only see, you can only sense it when you put your fingers uh, on your on your on your wrist, and you know you try to focus a little bit, and you know see if the heart rate is still there, and and then you can see it, right? So that's exactly how I think of DevOps. There's a lot that you can see, and it's visible. You know, for example, one of the first things that organizations who started some of these journeys that I talked about, you know, they would go to these uh, uh, you know software organizations who've been building and delivering software and helping DoD get better. The first thing they would be mesmerized by is the ping pong tables, <laughs> right? Or the snacks uh, and the wonderful, you know, the, the open collaboration spaces that were there. Uh, so, you know, very different environment. And that's, you know, sometimes is all what you see, just, you know, amazing people doing amazing work, but there's a lot that's happening underneath. So, you know, I said, you know, what would be beneficial for this audience? This is not a very technical talk. I wanted to make this something that you could relate, whether you are a developer sitting here or a business a decision maker here who are trying to figure out, if I, want this, if I want to replicate this in this region or in my organization, what can I do? How do I start? What does it look like as I'm scaling this? And then what does it look like when I'm you know, reaching what is considered you know, at the scale that Kessel Run or Kobayashi Maru is at this point? What does this journey look like? And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about here. right? Just to give you a little bit of a recipe or what this looks like. Hopefully this gives you an opportunity to have a conversation, an ongoing dialogue with us, with other organizations who are doing this type of work, and then you know, figure out ways in which we can enable this DevOps journey, this innovation, this transformation for your organization. So there are three phases, I would put it, in terms of how organizations get started, and then how they think about growth when they have already taken that very first step, and then what it comes, what it starts to look like when you're starting to scale that across multiple product teams, delivering capabilities to different regions and theaters. So the inception phase looks something like this. You just start with a current mission problem, not a future mission problem that requires artificial intelligence and machine learning. <laughs> you can certainly pick something you know, that's fancy and uh, you know, requires a little bit of extensive technology implementation, but start simple. I think it's very important that we focus on something that's relevant to the mission today, right? That you can see, even if it doesn't have to be a big problem, it could be a small problem, but you have to start today something that's relevant to the warfighters, to the mission today. You stand up a software product team, right? A team of four to five individuals who have some level of software competency, who can write some code, maybe. Uh, and if you don't have that, you can certainly bring on you know, contractors and experts who have that experience, so it doesn't have to be airmen. But the great thing about the three case studies that I talked about, uh, Kessel Run, Kobayashi Maru, and Bespin, is that they, they were looking to make an investment in the organization itself, which means they were bringing airmen forward and saying, hey, we want to enable our airmen who better understand the mission to work with industry counterparts who don't understand the mission, but they may have a much more technical understanding of the, the solution set and the technology. So it was really that pairing of people who understood the mission but didn't have a strong technical background, and the people who didn't really understand the mission as well, but had a strong technical background, and bringing those organizations or groups together to say, let's go solve a problem and see how well you do, right? So that's how a lot of these models sprung up. Uh, you know, industry and DOD coming together in small teams, you know, and, and moving forward. And then you're starting to think about, okay, the application that we want to build, something that we want to solve, 
we want to figure out an MVP, which stands for Minimum Viable Product, just a term that we use, something that's not fully fledged, built out, right, doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but something that's just enough to say, you know what, this is something that can start to take a crack at that, solving that mission problem that we are trying and struggling with for so long. And you know what, based on my personal experience, what I have seen, people at the edge, when they see something that can even solve one-tenth of the problem that they're having, they're more willing to give it a try than asking for the 100 requirements that they think that they need to be able to continue and operate on their mission, right? And that's the whole point, starting with a different mentality, starting with a different mindset of not having a fully-fledged environment, fully-fledged application released to production, but just enough that it scratches the itch and makes sure that, hey, it can start to solve that problem and start chipping at it little by little over time. And then that's exactly how it happens. You know, you continuously iterate over that application, that product team, and then uh, hopefully, you know, we start to see some real outcomes, real mission-driven outcomes with end user adoption, gaining more and more popularity. And you can see, you know, commanders coming in saying, you know, how are you guys doing this? And yesterday I needed 10 people, now I only need two people to do this. Well, here are some other things that you can go solve for me now. <laughs> So that's is the inception phase, right? Uh, starting small, starting with the current challenge, and then you know, putting a team together, letting them go, and giving them the support, giving them the encouragement to go solve a problem. The next is comes growth, right? What happens when you have delivered that very first capability out in production? Now what? Now you need to think about how do you replicate that again and again with multiple product teams and looking at multiple different but interrelated mission problems. The example that you see here is from Kessel Run. So on the left, you see the air tasking cycle, right? And how it's used to be denoted, and currently the way the future architecture is. And a lot of the capabilities are already being delivered today at the IUD Cutter Air Force Base. That's what you see on the right, right? A very modern interpretation of how they're thinking about the ATO cycle. And previously, if I'm not mistaken, you know, it used to take any, anywhere between 72 hours or plus to figure out that entire you know, mission planning. But with some of the tools and technologies that Castlebron has deployed today, you know, they're able to streamline that process to you know, a, a few hours rather than 72 hours. Right? So it's starting to see that you know, this Uber air power, this concept of you know, when you request something, it's there, like we see when we request an Uber or a Lyft today similar mindset of how do we streamline that entire process so you can make better decisions, you can make decisions quicker, and you can respond much better to what's going on in the field. Once you have a set of interrelated problems that you're going to go after, right, and you have a strategy, right, you're not just picking, you know, random things, you have somebody who understands the mission and how to go about organizing or solving different interrelated problems that can come together. The next thing you're probably going to look at is prioritizing a set of your core mission uh, problems using, I would suggest, web-based applications, but that may not always be the case, right? That's what I'm saying. You want to prioritize something that can be easily deploy, that can be easily scaled. But I know, you know, DOD Air Force mission is huge, it's large. Sometimes you need desktop intensive applications that need graphic units and other things. There's certainly, you know, opportunity for us to talk about those. But you know, start with something that's relatively modern that you can easily deploy in a cloud-based environment, and then if you need to, you can run it at the edge, right? So here I put some, you know, just references to some open-source technologies that are very popular both on the industry side. You know, pretty much 70% or 80% of the enterprises out, out there are either building in Java or they're building in .NET, and that's why I put those there. And then for the most part. A lot of the industry has just, uh, uh, you know, decided that you know the modern way of building and delivering software capabilities. They're using two tools particularly: uh, Docker containers and Kubernetes. Again, you know, these are just technologies that have come out over the past five to six years, and they have grown and seen a level of maturity and adoption in the commercial side. And you're also seeing great adoption in the DoD. So, like, these are great technologies that you should be thinking about, among many others as you're building, <laughs> as you're starting to build and deliver, uh, you know, those capabilities. And then finally, you know, this is something that we typically, I've seen some organizations miss, and that's why I wanted to mention this and emphasize, it's very important, 
that as you're starting this growth phase in your organization, you want to make a commitment to investing in the personnel at different levels, right? And that uh, investment has to come in making sure you're enabling a culture that is supportive, that has a growth mindset, where people aren't uh, beholden to the same hierarchy that you know typically DODs hold into. Like something, you know, trying to level the plane a little bit, where you know even if it's a small airman who has a great idea, his idea is still valued as much as somebody who's a little bit upper in the chain of hierarchy. Uh, you know, thinking about organization culture is very important to start to think about that. You know, again, there are many ways in which you can proceed it, but you know, again, fostering an environment where it becomes nurturing, supportive of people and teams who are building and delivering these capabilities, and it's not just in the organization that's building it, but also helping your end users and the their culture, which is you know very rigid right now, helping them understand how this is going to work because it's a learning process for them as well not just for the organization that's building and delivering capabilities. And then finally, you know, if an organization is leading this DevOps transformation, the software-led transformation, you have to make the time to invest in your leadership, right? We do, DOD does a lot of great leadership training and enablement, but it's slightly different when it comes to leading software organizations. So figuring out what that leadership opportunity development looks like and investing in those individuals who can lead these teams is going to significantly pay as you see your organization grow and scale over time. Any questions so far before I continue? I'm going to give a small pause and see if there are any questions. Sure. Yeah, if I, maybe I can rephrase the question and you let me know if I'm on, on point, if I understand correctly. Are you, so it feels like there were two things you wanted to talk about. First is the, you know, we understand that when, particularly when um, in, in the military people are reassigned every two years or so, right, to a different mission, you know, how does that transformation, how does that change account for when you're trying to build something that's more sustainable and long term? And then, the second question, or maybe interrelated, was around So maybe I can share some of my comments, but you know I, I, I don't think I'll be able to speak much to it. I have seen that when there is leadership change in these software organizations, right? It is to some degree you're resetting. Uh, there's a lot of resetting going on because you know that that leader has a level of priorities. They're driving the organization in a certain way, and when you have new leaders come in, they're trying to bring their own perspectives and their own experiences forward. Uh, you know, and they come back, they come and they look at uh, what's going well and where they think the, op the, the organization is struggling with it, or there might be opportunities to you know, further accelerate the mission towards. So, uh, you know, there is no easy answer to this other than what the, the leader that is about to leave, you know, what they can do is really help the incoming leader understand the history of the organization, how it's grown over time, where they see the current challenges because they have a lot of insight and depth living in that environment for you know over the past two or three plus years. So you know being able to share that and the new oncoming leader being able to take on that responsibility and understanding like where the organization has been and having that context to be able to then figure out where they want to take the organization forward. So that's where I see uh, you know in, when it comes to leadership, I know. You know, similar impacts I've seen across different product teams themselves, particularly within the product teams when you have airmen who are part of delivering the capabilities. When you see a lot of rotation, it becomes very difficult for that team to, you know, support that ongoing rotation of airmen who are coming in, you know, maybe helping drive to a certain degree, but then every time you have a new 
person that's that's part of your product team now you have to help them ramp up you know understand a little bit of the context around how their products built where it's, it is and what the future roadmap is so you know those are some things uh, that I think every organization has to figure out over time what I have seen is that um, you know, there has been a heavy emphasis in having a core team that's like that's primarily led by contractors who are there for the more longer term, and then helping airmen rotate in and out. That way, they're getting that experience, but it's not the airmen who are who who understand the mission and continue to be an important element of the team driving the solution forward. But you know, there is something that's a little bit more steady presence in the organization. You know, through contractors to be able to make sure that hey the organization can continue to deliver with this ongoing change across different levels in the organization. I don't know if that even uh, answers your question, but some of the thoughts that I have at this point. Sure. Thanks, Joel. So, you know, when, you, when you're in, in line of the three themes that I talked about, right, the first was around thinking of multiple interrelated mission problems, and you saw the Castle Run, you know, thinking of the ATO cycle holistically, not just about pinpointing one particular problem that they want to go solve. You did that in the first phase. Then thinking about the, you know, sort of understanding what technologies and tools you want to bring into the play because that's going to be, that's going to play a part in helping you achieve that mission. And then thinking of the investments that you're making in personnel. A lot of that investment is going to be happening across these multiple uh, buzzwords that I put on the slide, right? Uh, starting to think about, remember I talked about, you know, having a different mindset when it comes to building and delivering capabilities? This is how you start to enable and educate the, the, the individuals within the team and empower them to make this transition by giving them an opportunity to understand and practice principles from lean startup, where again, you're not thinking of building the fully fledged application that meets all your thousand requirements, but just enough, a single slice that can you know, satiate the appetite a little bit and then starting to build on that again more and more. Thinking of principles like design thinking, you know, there's these principles or these practices around product management, around user-centered design, test-driven development. They play a very important role and this is how, for the most part, industry is building and delivering capabilities. You know, we will hear Joel talk about the Microsoft story and you'll hear him talk about the changes that we did in the organization and how we restructured the organization around product, around engineering, and around other groups to enable that cohesion, to enable that you know, productivity, as well as software development that can accelerate. The next thing you're probably thinking of is you know, all these product teams that are building applications right, for the end user of that mission they're not going to be super successful if there is what is considered the foundational teams, as I call them, that are not providing them the right tools, the environments, right? Somebody has to be there providing them the core infrastructure, right? The, the water has to run, the electricity has to be there, and, and the power and cooling has to be there in order for the teams who are building the mission applications to deliver capabilities. And I'll say this. A lot of the product teams get all the visibility and the you know kudos and high fives, but these teams are doing a lot of the heavy lifting so that product teams can do what they're doing and do this amazingly well. So like these teams often get unrecognized for the amount of effort and time they're putting in, but they're doing significantly, you know, if they're doing their job well, they're significantly improving the way organization can build and deliver capabilities. So foundational teams typically consist of people and individuals who are managing platforms. And you know, these are typically application platforms that application is running on to include the underlying infrastructure, right? Uh, these are individuals who are helping develop these platforms, deploy these platforms, support these platforms on an ongoing basis. Uh, you might involve individuals, you know, because of the way DOD works, in the commercial sector, you know, we don't have to get clearances <laughs> to be able to uh, deploy application in production, but maybe in the DOD, that's a hard requirement. So one of the things that's becoming more and more prominent is teams who build software don't necessarily need a DOD clearance because that's not something that's required. Maybe they have some representation there, but people who are running the applications in production, in operations, do need that clearance. And that's why you see a surge of this new role called application operations. People who are not developing the application 
They're still part of the product team to some degree, but they're more responsible for just running the application and supporting that to the different teams that are building and delivering capabilities for the warfighter. And this works out really well because, you know, the people who are typically doing application operations, they have a lot of, you know, they're very close to the end users, they have a lot of domain knowledge, but to some degree they're also the, uh, you know, the bridge between the product team and the end user. And, and they can be very supportive and encouraging and, and strengthening that bond between product teams and the, and the end users and building trust in the application itself over time as it continues to grow and mature. And then there are other disciplines that I talked about, you know, release engineering, security, chaos, and data. I'm not going to go into all of these, but the chart that I have listed, uh, you know, Google has done an amazing job in talking about the level of operational, uh, you know, operational maturity an organization can achieve uh, as they think about improving their operations over time. For example, like, you know, you know what is chaos engineering? You, know, you probably have heard of it, and you just don't recognize the name. It's like when you, on purpose, <laughs> introduce uh, failure into your system. And you know, DoD does this every day. You know, you're running through exercises. You're trying to figure out if something fails, how do I respond? That's exactly what chaos engineering is, but just applied at the technology, at the application layer, at the platform layer, and just having some you know discipline around making sure that hey. We need to figure out, not only is it just about building applications and delivering it quickly, but making sure that when something happens, you know, particularly in production, whether it's the underlying infrastructure, the platform, or something, you know, we have an adversarial attack, we're able to, you know, we're able to stay flexible, we're able to maneuver and figure out how we can respond in those, in those situations. So a lot of the great work is published there, and certainly, you know, we, Microsoft continues to make investments in these, uh, in these areas as well. Perhaps what I'm trying to say is that in order for this to be successful, the product teams are very important. At the same time, the foundational teams are also important. And if they're not working with a similar mindset on some of these principles, and then supporting each other, right? You have the dev and you have the ops. And ops is here, people who are running these systems, who are running these applications. If they're not coming together and enabling the mission, right, you're always going to see this. What we, and, and what we see today as well, this, um, you know, this tension between these two groups because development is often thought about as releasing new features and functionality as quickly as possible. And ops is often thought of as, no, no, no. The more change that you introduce, the more chaos <laughs> exists in my environment, and I can't, I can't continue to deal with this because you know, we understand the reality is you know there's always fire in production, and somebody was trying to you know fight that fire all the time, and when, when you do that day in and day out, you know it becomes tedious, it becomes draining on you. So DevOps, at the end of the day, is yes an organizational transformation, but it's the way it happens is by enabling these development teams and these operations teams to work together more collaboratively using similar ideas, principles, and being supportive of each other, right? And those organizations who can do this well achieve great outcomes. <coughs> this, uh, I don't know if, if you have a context here, but you know, in the past, we used to say, uh, it works in my machine, so hopefully it works in production uh, as a developer, and then after DevOps, you know, just people who start to Say like as long as we can just adopt modern technologies, everything is you know uh, everything is all and well. You know modern technologies have come in like Docker containers, but it's still the same problem. So I'm hoping, hoping, trying to pick, you know, hoping that this message says just by adopting new technologies, it's not going to solve your organization problems. You have to focus on the technology for for a bit, but at the same time focus on the organization, the culture that exist within the multiple teams, particularly development and teams you're running your platforms and applications in production. Uh, and you know, this is what we see typically, right? The development teams saying, here's the application, you go deploy it, and the ops team like, ah, how do I even deploy this, right? So hopefully this is not what's happening in your organization. So the next thing, right, arriving at the final stage of what this starts to look like when you've done this well, it's all measured by, you know, our behaviors are shaped by what we measure. So it's very important that we're measuring the right things now that we have multiple product teams delivering core functionality in production and 
uh, helping drive that you know, overall mission outcome, which is for Kessel Run, was reducing the time it takes to continue, you know, complete that air tasking order. There is a lot of metrics that you can look at. There's not, uh, you know, there's not a, I've done, I'm not trying to provide a holistic list here, but there are different categories that you should be thinking about if your organization is doing this well, right? How do you know? How do you know that what you're doing, it's working, right? If you're not seeing these type of metrics in your organization over time, then you know there's room for improvement. And you know, this, these aren't the, like the North Star. There's certainly room for improvement in these metrics as well. But like, these are some essential things that you can take away that you can start to measure very quickly, you know, even on a back of a napkin, to be honest. And you can see how the organization is doing over time. So in product development, what I've seen is that for teams who are able to do this effectively and the underlying platforms there, the underlying infrastructure is there, regardless of where that production is, they're able to deliver applications, right? From initial conception of the idea to the first deployment in production within 90 to 120 days. The example of Kessel Run, one of the other reasons why I picked is because they were developing applications you know, on the mainland <laughs> in California, in Boston, Massachusetts, but their production was on impact level six, zipper environment in IUD, right, in Qatar. So you know, very different and you know, very far removed from where the development was happening, but the teams were still able to deliver new capabilities out to the edge in 90 to 120 days, right? So if you're starting to see those metrics in your organization, you should say, like, we're doing something right, and we should continue to support that. If you're not seeing, if you're seeing increasingly product teams taking longer and longer to get into production, you know there's opportunity for improvement there. Most of the applications that I've seen and supported in production, uh, working through some of these software factories, I've seen a huge uh, level of adoption by end users within, within nine to 16 months. Right, compared to, and this is the this is the value of lean startup, this lean idea of you know building something and quickly iterate on it, where you're starting to build trust with the end user. And they're like, you know what, this legacy system it just keeps on falling down. I'm much rather using this new application that gives me only partial functionality, but it's much more responsive and gets me where I need to go, versus trying to you know continue to tigger with the the legacy system that I'm trying to figure out how to even operate. Um, and then, you know, again, it's a range, but application teams are able to do much more frequent deployments all the way to production, right? Regardless of where it is, in hours or days at a minimum, right? What I've seen product teams deliver, you know, critical bug fixes in a day, you know, new feature releases, you know, small changes, minor improvements in five days or less, right? Sometimes they're working on multiple features that take a time but they're doing weekly deployments, if not daily deployments, all the way out to production. So this is what good starts to look like when you have product teams enabled and powered, and they're able to build and deliver capabilities out at the edge. Uh, around platform, again, there's a lot that is in here. And remember, you know, there's that big slice that you don't see. But typically, when you're thinking about what's running your applications in production, you're thinking of not just the initial bootstrap and the install process. You know, it's very easy for someone to say, hey, it takes four hours to get this up and running, so you should go use this product or this service. What I've seen most organizations struggle with and fail uh, to some degree is like, when it comes to day two operations, and that's why I highlight this, right? What does it take for me to now run this platform that's now running all these applications in operations on an ongoing basis, right? With continuous updates, with continuous security patches and releases. That's where you, that's where platforms who have been designed well, who have been built with operations in mind, will outshine because you understand the investment that those commercial organizations or your own organization has made in making sure that this is something that you can run year after year, decade after decade. Because that's, you know, what we know, that's how it, that's how the lifetime is for a typical application in DOD, right? You're running it for at least 10 to 15 years, if not more. So you want to make sure that the underlying platform is as secure and as updated as the product and the applications that are running on top. 
the other thing is, you know, think, thinking about mean time to recovery. If the platform that is supporting all your applications, it's no longer there, what does it take for that team that's empowered to run and manage that platform to bring it back to life? If it's taking a couple of hours, great. If it's taking a couple of days, okay. If it's taking weeks or even months, then you know that you know we need to do some things or change some things around here to you know maybe find a different platform or find a different way of making sure that this is something that we can streamline the mean time to recovery. And then finally, product teams are always going to be asking for new product features uh, that will require new data technologies, new messaging technologies. So one of the things that I've seen is you know what denotes a good platform from not a good platform is the ability to empower that innovation that's being led by product teams by bringing new data technologies or new messaging technologies and other supporting services that an application needs and making that part of the holistic platform overall. If it's taking a year for a new service to come into platform, you know that means the lead time for a new service, for a new innovation to happen is now a year, <laughs> right? So these are some you know, high level metrics that you should be thinking about, like what it takes not only get started initially, but the level of effort it takes to continue to run in operations on an ongoing basis, and then what does it look like in terms of bringing it back up when everything just goes kaput, and then finally, how can you make sure that the platform continues to enable innovation, not hinder it as it grows over time. In terms of application performance and monitoring, there is a lot that you can look at, right? And this is, again, a very, very streamed down list of some of the core metrics that product teams need. They don't need a lot of fancy dashboards, but they just need, you know, simple telemetry around what's happening, how much traffic am I getting, am I seeing any latency in the responses of my application from end users, you know, am I seeing any errors, uh, am I able to scale my application when I need to, what sort of events, you know, application restart, uh, you know, boot, bootstrap times, and you know, just you know, simple telemetry is all application teams need to be able to have a level of visibility and insight. When it comes to software releases, what I've seen good organizations, from the time a product team says, I'm ready to release this new version of my source code in production, and the time it takes to build, compile, to run, run through a series of tests, maybe unit tests, maybe performance test, maybe some sort of acceptance test, all of that is automated to the time that they have a final artifact that can be deployed into production that's fully automated and that it can be built anywhere between five to 15 to 20 minutes, right? And there's no manual process whatsoever in that entire process. And when you start to see that application teams can deliver, right, from the time they make a commit in source code to the time something can be deployed in production, that's good, right, five to 15 minutes. And then production deployments itself, from the time you have that artifact now, that's ready to be deployed in production. If you can deploy that artifact in production, regardless of where it is, in one to two hours, then you're golden, <laughs> right? And I'm saying this because I've seen this in practice, and this is what Kesselron is able to do today and some of the other software organizations. So this is no longer a myth in DOD. <laughs> Right, I've supported, my personally supported multiple application teams that had either critical, uh, you know, bug fixes or critical functionality that needed to be updated, and you know, we supported these applications, and that's how long it took, right, to include transitioning from unclassified environments to classified environments. Sometimes you sneaker net it, right, and the the long delay time that you're seeing here is usually the time it takes to sneaker net because the rest of the system is automated from the time you commit to the time an artifact is made the manual process to update, go from low to high, and then a continuous, uh, you know, continuous deployment from once it's on a, on a classified level all the way into production. From, in terms of security and risk, again, there's a lot that we can talk about here, but what I've started to see is organizations who have done this well, they're able to do application assessments in a couple of weeks rather than months and sometimes even years that we're typically known uh, that are very well known in the DOD, right? So there's a lot of investment that these organizations make in standing up a security engineering team who not only to some degree provides the right tools, but enables and empowers the organization to deliver capabilities, right? They're making sure that risk is always managed, right? We're not trying to eliminate risk here, 
We're not trying to say hey, this is less secure than the way DOD has been building. It's just trying to figure out what is that you know, good balance between velocity and risk, inheritance and acceptance within the DOD. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah? Yeah, and I think it starts with the conversation, uh, to be honest. But then we can, you know, we can certainly bring for these organizations who have done this well, talk about what they are doing in much more detail, in terms of you know how they help, uh, you know, from the very beginning, how they have security at the very forefront of product development. So it's not something that you're thinking of once the product has been fully built, and now you're having to think about security testing and DT and other things, right? Operational testing, security is baked from day one in product development and how product gets initiated. And then the other other reason why this is streamlined so much is this idea of inheritance, right? When you, in the traditional model, what we have seen is DOD says, here is the entire architecture, my infrastructure, my platform, and my application. And any time that application needs to go into production, I have to accredit that entire system. And that's what takes you know, months and years to accredit. The paradigm change that these software organizations have brought forward is this idea that once I accredit the infrastructure, it's accredited. I no longer have to accredit it again. Once I accredit the platform, it's accredited. I no longer have to accredit it again. And the only thing that I'm changing in the environment is introducing new capabilities or new applications in that. So I'm not, every single time a new capability has to be delivered, the only delta that's changing is the application itself. I mean, the platform is also evolving, but it has its own ATO of sorts, where you know that, I and it's working within that paradigm. So it's you know breaking up that model of we have to accredit the entire you know from the infrastructure all the way to the application individually to saying infrastructure is accredited, great. Platform is accredited, great. And then application teams they have a you know streamlined security process through which they go through, but they know that as long as you're running within the confines of this environment, this application, this platform, your application is going to stay secure and it's, it, it inherits all the security benefits that the infrastructure and the application platform is providing. So that's how these application teams are able to quickly deliver without having to think about this you know, massive ATO package that they need to put together because it's a very streamlined process. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk more about that and see how we can help your organization. So there's the question. Yeah, that's a <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, in terms of support, I think we're still trying to figure out, to be honest, in terms of what the long-term support looks like because this is so new in the DoD right now, and I'm just, I'm just trying to understand what the support model looks like 10 to 15 years from now. But one of the things that I talked about previously, if you hear, uh, when I talked about application operations, right, that team likely is the one that's going to take on a level of support. Say that again, sorry? No, no, no. So maybe I m misstate 
that what the intent and the purpose of application operations team is. This is part of the software organization. This is not the end users, right, or the admins there. This is part of the software organization, and one of the charters that they have to take on is figuring out how to provide that long-term support because they are so close to the front end user, and they're the ones who are running this application day in and day out to some degree while it's being used in mission. So even, even with people who are rotating in the application operations team, there's going to be a certain level of, uh, you know, they have to figure out that model where they can continue to support this even as people rotate. But I feel like that's probably, yeah, you're right. You know, for the product teams who are building new capabilities, when they feel like there is no longer an opportunity for us, for them to continue to support additional features and functionality, that application is likely to go, going to go in as much mature for more of a steady state model, right? There's no, long, no longer you're thinking of new feature releases, but more so bug fixes and you know, critical vulnerabilities. And then it's the application team that makes sure that, hey, those little changes that are coming across, how do you make sure that the application can continue to run for you know, year, year after year? So I think that model, to be honest, you know, I don't have a clear and good answer to that, but I think application operations team is key to empowering that because you're right, product team themselves would not take on supporting that product for the, <laughs> the 10 years, right? They're going to move on to building new features and functionality for different products if need be. So I'll, I'll try to expedite. I think I don't, I only have a few more slides. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of security and risk assessment, and you know, you mentioned, you made a comment, like when 10% of the, the security code is, or the code is changed, then you need a new ATO. The idea here is that you're not making a 10%, I mean, regardless of, the idea is that, you know, if you're trying to minimize, uh, you know, minimize, first you're trying to improve the, the level of change, the, the velocity at which you're introducing a change, but that change delta is very small. And that's why you're trying to make sure that you're never having to change 10% of the code all at one time to be able to get into production. The idea should be, how can I make you know, small changes and quickly release into production? And that's a, that's a whole continuous ATU model, is that you're not making huge changes in the application before you release in production. Sure. Okay. Basically, from the day you gave the first capability, you lost. A year later, after you've done five more releases, you get double the code. Sure. And I agree. I think sometimes if it requires, if the change has been significant, it does require a new ATO, and I think there's nothing, you know, certainly a new assessment needs to be made. Again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go through a, you know, you want to make sure that what feels right by the organization, those practices and principles are put in place. So if a significant change has been made to the application and it requires another assessment, you know, go ahead and make that assessment. But at the same time, you're not preventing the application from being released into production, production because of the level of change that has been made. You're just, you know, making sure that the level of risk can be accepted with the level of change that's been made. So it's always about management of that risk. And then, you know, when it comes to, so I've, for the most part I've talked about the different teams. I've talked about the development teams and what sort of metrics you start to see. I talked briefly about the platform team and what level, sort of metrics you start to see. Security teams, what sort of metrics start to make sense. What do you measure at the organization level, right? At the leadership level, when they're looking at across multiple product teams, across different organizations, what is that heartbeat that you can start to get and measure how your organization is doing overall? There's an assessment that was done called DORA, DevOps Research and Assessment, uh, by people who have done, who've been doing this for you know, a lot longer than I have <laughs> and have a lot of deep expertise and knowledge in DevOps across multiple organizations. They, uh, they boil this down to four core metrics. Deployment frequency, lead time for change, change failure rate, and time to restore a service. As long as an organization can just measure these four uh, metrics and the organization level across all the different product teams, you have at least a good heartbeat in terms of how you can see how the organization is doing, your software organization, when you have multiple product teams delivering capabilities. 
this is what it starts to look like. You know, people who are doing this really well, you know, they can talk about <coughs> how many more times they're able to deploy applications in production, how, how much faster they're able to deploy applications in production from commit to the actual deployment. How quickly can they recover? And then what is the change fail rate? And you're like, you know, this is from the industry. Uh, we've never seen something like this. This is the example that Kessel Run from one of their latest uh, uh, you know, presentations showed about what, and then this is recent in 2021, and you can start to see some of those metrics, right? Number of deployments, deployment frequency, lead time, change fail rate, and this is something that I was really proud to see at organization level. They're starting to see and measure and, you know, hold themselves accountable because at the end of the day, they have to make sure that the whole mindset is we continuously improve, right? This is not the North Star. We're always trying to reach that North Star which is always, you know, you're always working towards it. It's the horizon, you can never match it, but you're continuously improving at the product level, at the platform level, at the organization level as a whole as well. So with that, uh, just a quick touch up on tools and technologies. You don't need a lot. I think this is probably the recipe for, you know, you just need some sort of a source code technology repository. You need something that has, you can manage your artifacts, something that can build your automation pipelines, you know, a way for product teams to track and manage your backlog, and a set of security tools that can scan your source code, you know, for uh, security analysis, you know, your software runtime dependencies, maybe your containers. Multiple teams, multiple companies are out there, GitLab, GitHub, GitHub has some of these, you know, many of these features. And then in terms of running the application today, primarily, as I said, the industry at large has consolidated on using two key technologies. There are other technologies that build on top of this, but the two key technologies is Docker containers, where you actually package the application, and then what runs that application that's packaged inside that Docker container is something called Kubernetes, which is the underlying you know, orchestration layer that runs and manages the life cycle of that container in production. And you probably have heard of Platform One, you know, the DOD DevSecOps reference architecture. That's a great place to start. We certainly have examples of other uh, platforms. You know, the Red Hat OpenShift is a good example. They have built their entire ecosystem uh, for Red Hat OpenShift on top of these two technologies. I know VMware Tanzu has made a lot of investments in this. So you, know, you can certainly go out and start to talk about, you know, platforms whether it's core infrastructure, core open source, or some of these platforms that these companies have invested in to make a more streamlined experience for product development and operations. And then at the end, right, you also have cloud providers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, who are making heavy investments in better supporting these uh, you know, Kubernetes-centric models. So we have you know, CNCF certified Kubernetes distributions. We also have platform services, as we call them where you can still run your Docker containers, you're not locked in, right? And you can certainly run it in the cloud and then run it at the edge, but as long as you're maintaining these two core technologies, you're pretty vendor agnostic and cloud agnostic, and you have that flexibility to continue and operate in a DevSecOps model. With that, I am going to transition to our next speaker, Joel. At the end of the day, you know, DevOps is a transformation of the organization. It's less about the tools and technology and more about how do you help an organization meet or enable its mission, which is largely driven through software. So, and there are a lot of elements that I talked about, and you'll start to see, as Joel talks about the Microsoft story, how, how we, right, one of the biggest software organizations in the world, how we, got, how we went through that journey, and you hopefully some of the topics and the you know, things that I talked about, you'll start to see resonate in the Microsoft story itself. So with that, uh, there's a quick uh, film as Joel comes on that I'll play, and that would be my portion of the talk. Holland comes in for a pit stop. Time to refuel and change tires. 
Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch. Tires are changed at last. A crewman polishes the windshield as Holland moves away just 67 seconds after he stops. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so my name is Joel Day, and thank you for being out here. So I like to do a few things whenever I talk about DevOps. One of those things is uh, wear my lucky DevOps shirt and show this video. The reason I like to show this video is it kind of demonstrates visually what we mean by the benefits of DevOps. I've been with Microsoft since about 2010, and when I joined Microsoft, we were more in that first portion of the video. And when I start talking about the transformation that Microsoft went through from the first part to the second part, I want you to be thinking about where you guys are in your software deployment or your software development um, journey, um, getting from that first part to the second part. So I want to highlight a couple of things here. So this is a, a freeze frame, and I want to talk about, um, let's see, doing the highlight. I'm gonna try and do a laser pointer. So a couple of things I've noticed, the more you look at this screen, the more you realize a couple of interesting things. First off, there's a person right here that has another jack in front of the per or behind the person that jacked up the back of the car. And when I look at this, I think, what is that? That is redundancy. So when you're thinking about your, um, you, you know, your process for building out software, uh, much like in this case, it, sometimes it's faster to have a backup in place than it is to try and reposition and, and, and jack up the back of the car. Up here in the top corner, we have some folks that are just sitting and they're watching. They're continuously monitoring what's going on and they're trying to make improvements for next time. You have multiple people on the bottom that have one role. They're, they're highly cohesive. Um, they are loosely coupled, they have one action, they perform it, and then they move out of the way for the next person. So the way that uh, Formula One racing went from that first part to the second part was by doing these things, these things that we are doing in the software development world. And I want to jump onto this next screen and I want to talk about um, this right here, this, this sentence. This is actually by our chief DevOps engineer at Microsoft, his name is Donovan Brown. And when he was coming up with the, the theme, with the, you know, the, what, what, is, what is the definition of DevOps to Microsoft? This is what he came up with. And uh, I think it really underscores Microsoft's perspective on this. And one thing that I, I think this highlights is that it's a cultural shift more than it is a software change. So it says that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. And I like the word value because the word value means different things to different people. And that should be the end goal, is thinking about you know, what is the value that we're trying to bring to our end users and what can we do to make sure that, that value is increased. All right, so let's talk about Microsoft's journey to DevOps. Uh, I have this up here, it's you know, the, the age old question, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. And so to start off with, Microsoft had to define what does it mean by done. And the way that we did that is by looking at 
you know, you know where, where were we in terms of developing software? And, and I, all of this change occurred when there was a, 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 a compelling event at Microsoft. That compelling event was we got a new CEO. Uh, the new CEO, Satya, he came in and um, he wanted to make things a little bit different. And I think there's one thing, if you want to know one of the ways that our new CEO made Microsoft a different place, um, there is no person on his t leadership team that has the word Windows in their title. There was a huge shift from the way that we did things to the way that we are doing things now. And there's been a big emphasis on changing the culture, changing the way that we look at value, and the way that we interact with our customers. And so the way that we did that was we got to define done. So that was the first step. How do we define what does it mean to be finished? It needs to be live in production, collecting telemetry. We need to have some sort of a, a reason for deployment, and we have to be able to test that hypothesis. And then we have to figure out how we're going to do that next deployment. So in order to do that, we had to do some organizational changes within our company. This is a standard org chart. This is how most people have their development teams established. You have your program management, your developers, and your testers. What we needed to do was we merged our developers and our testers into engineering. So all developers are testers and all testers are developers. And then we had to include a new organization called operations. So DevOps, you need to have that ops. And for security, I, you know, we talk about DevSecOps. Well, um, sometimes I, I don't include sec because I feel like security should be baked in from the beginning. I always, so I feel that security, the, the, the secure development life cycle should be paramount in any development shop. So if I neglect security, it's not because I'm neglecting it, it's because to me, security is baked in from the beginning. So not only did we change how our organization was structured, we also changed how our organization was grouped. We did not have a sole engineering team and a sole operations team and a sole management team. We actually had multiple smaller teams that focused on a single customer base and they received feedback from the customer. They brought that back and then that's how they did their iterative change. How can you build value to your end user if you as a team do not have a specific customer in mind? And that is a cultural change. That is not a software change. And I think that's going to be the theme that you're going to hear throughout this is this is not software. This is, this is changing that people and that process. Products will come, but people and process are paramount. So another way of putting that, this is how it used to be. We would have organizations that focused on UI. We had organizations that focused on the back end, the front end, and the data layer. Well, we had to shift from a horizontal to a vertical. So we had to vertically integrate all of these teams together. And the reason why, and we'll, we'll get this as a theme um, later on, but the reason why we found that this works is because we tested this, just like what we saw in the video. You know, as you observe and as you try new things, and if you see that that makes better value at a faster time, then you keep iterating on it. So we have striven for vertical integration across all of the different teams in order to find those cohesive groups. Now there was a question that I really liked about churn. And it goes down, it, it, it comes back to, you know, what do you define a team as? So this is how we define our teams. Um, you know, they need to be physically located, proximal. This was, you know, pre-COVID, you had to be like in the same area, but now it's, you know, you can, with, with Zoom, um, you know, the world is your, 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 uh, your office, so uh, you need to be cross-discipline. You need to have those security experts on your team, each team. So we had clear chartered goals and we had objectives. Uh, each team owned a feature and each team owned a product and their own production. Now I want to talk about churn because that is something that is very um, interesting within, within the government space. And, I've been developing software inside the government since I was in high school. Um, I started it as a, as a GS5 um, in, right when I was graduating from high school, working in the, 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 the J6 shop uh, as a help desk technician. And what I found is 
I, I would rather, you know, write a script to fix someone's computer on a, on a phone call than, than actually go in and log in and fix the computer. And I, f I found that I was spending like three, four hours writing this, this script to fix a single issue. And other folks were, you know, they were closing three, four tickets during that time, and I was only closing one. And um, what happened was, you know, we started, and we'll talk about, you know, you get what you measure. Uh, we were being measured on how many tickets were being closed, and someone was coming saying, hey, Joel, you know, your ticket numbers are, are lower than the other folks. You know, how do, we, how do we improve on this? And what I found was I could take all those scripts I was writing, and I could deploy it across multiple people instead of having, you know, one ticket per customer, I was opening one ticket per issue and closing you know, 15 different issues. And so even though the number of tickets I was closing was lower, the amount of actual value I was delivering was higher. So I've been developing software for the government for a very long time, and we, what, what we see is there's a lot of churn. You know, you have rotations, people come in and out, and that is not unique to government. In fact, at Microsoft, we have this awesome exercise it's called the sticky note exercise. So every year, every product team puts up their, you know, all of their members on a sticky note. And every single developer has the ability to take their sticky note off of that product and move it to any other product that has an open spot. Now what that does is it drives a very interesting culture because what that enables the developer to do is say, hey, if I'm not getting the support that I need on this team, I can take my sticky note and go somewhere else. Which means that the dev leads, they need to be thinking, if I want to make my product successful, if I want to be successful as a dev lead, I need to make sure that my people don't leave. Because you know, every year, they're going to be able to have the opportunity to, to, to take their sticky note and go. So how, if you were to implement something like this, how would that change the way that you would plan meetings? How would that change the way that you talk to your developers, to your, te to your engineers, to your operations folks? Because each one of them has the opportunity every year to change teams, and it's a cultural, um, it's, it is a cultural imperative that if you are a developer and you leave to another team, that is encouraged. We want you to be where you are going to be the most productive. So you are not punished. In fact, you, if, if you stay and you're not happy, that is looked down upon. If you change teams, that is encouraged. So that is the culture. So every developer has that opportunity. Now, if you're not a good fit in any team, that's a different story. But this sticky note exercise forces this cultural change, and that aligns very similarly to how the government operates. You know, there's rotations, there's going to be churn. That needs to be written into how you do development. So, if you're doing development the same way as we were doing development in the 60s, yet you have this culture of high churn, how do you prevent feature loss, redundant development? How do you prevent your applications from stagnating or just becoming shelfware? And that's a very challenging problem. And the way that we did it at Microsoft is we, we had a standard release cycle. So the way that Microsoft does software deployment now is we focus on these three-week sprints. And these sprints, they have a structure to them so that you are continually delivering incremental value at each point. And the way that you measure that, and, and we'll talk about it in this couple of slides, is you need to be able to capture that. So there's a sprint planning, there's a done, there's a deployment, there's an overlap. You can see between done and deployment, there's an overlap with the next sprint. So it's basically a four week, I, I kind of call that like the, the, the um, I think it, it is called uh, sprint three plus one, or you can call it sprint zero. There, it's, it's basically the same thing. So depending on which side you're on. So during the planning session, there's an email sent out. Everyone coordinates. And at the end, there's another email that's sent out that has a video that talks about what was achieved. So you know that at the end of every three-week cycle, there's going to be an email that looks like this. 
I know this is really terrible, but it's going to have what bugs were fixed, what work items were finished, a video of any features that were added, and this email is automated. So if you don't put your work in the tool, it does not get captured in the automated email, and this email goes all the way up the chain. So anyone that is up in your management chain is going to receive this email and have the ability to go check that video. And so this puts that accountability on those developers because you know this is what we need to achieve in this sprint cycle and we know that at the end of it there's going to be a video that my boss's boss's boss is going to see. It's, that's how it's going to be. That is, um, that is the known. What that does is it gives predictability, but then it also gives accountability. So each developer, every feature can be traced back to the individual sprint, to the individual contributor, and all of that is documented. And it's documented in an automated fashion, which is, I think is fantastic. Um, so yeah, just kind of highlight some of that. Um, here's a little another, I'm quickly going through this. So here's another view of that same same, uh, you know, the content of that email. Now, when we talk about planning, the way that Microsoft does this, and um, I actually had a run-in with the development team on a call while I was here. Uh, you know, all of my team is on the East Coast, so it was like four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, where we divide up our planning in sprints, those three weeks, quarters, semesters, and then anything beyond a, a semester is called a strategy. And I had this call where we were talking about adding a feature for one of our government customers. They were asking for a specific thing. And what I found was engineering teams, when they start saying words like, oh, that's a semester activity, that's basically them saying, yeah, we're probably not going to do it. <laughs> Anytime they said, oh, yeah, we could probably do that in the sprint, yeah, that'll be good, that's usually them saying, that's code for them saying, yeah, you know what, we could probably fit, it, fit this into our normal activities. But the moment they started saying, yeah, that's a semester level change, that's basically saying that that's going to be equivalent to turning the entire ship all the way around. So um, I knew whenever I would make a suggestion, if someone said, it's a semester change, that was a nice way of them saying, no, we're not going to do it. But because they have this breakout, they can say, hey, we can categorize different changes. Is this a bug that's going to take a semester? Is this a feature that's going to take a semester? Well, we can now plan for that. We can account for that. So. There is a defined cycle for how all of these features and, and capabilities and this value, going back to that, that pivotal statement, how this value is going to be delivered to our, um, our customers. So now how was it before we started making these changes? So this is very similar to how I've seen uh, code developed inside, um, inside the government. We write some code. It's now code complete. We go into a testing phase, we code a little bit more, we stabilize, and you know, we have this release. Well, if the timeline for this entire cycle is more than one project manager's um, tour, how does that disrupt the delivery of that value? You know, if this is a 24 month de delivery cycle and tours are only 18 months, that means you're gonna have a handoff and I don't know about you, if you've ever, you know, stepped into a new project, the very first thing you do is say, well, that's not how I would do it. This is how I would do it. And then when you go in there and you start saying, well, this is how we're going to change it, that's going to add more technical debt and it's going to increase your timeline. So instead of having this kind of a life cycle, it, 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 with it, I think of this, um, I actually met the Internet Explorer team when I was in college. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, fun fact about Internet Explorer, so when Internet Explorer 6 came out, the entire team left to other projects and the only people that were left on Internet Explorer from the time that Windows, I think it was 98 to the point of, I think Windows, or Windows Vista came out, the only developers were security developers. There was no feature developers on the Internet Explorer team. They followed this kind of a of a pattern, you know, that, that whole test and stabilize, they lived in that for like six years and there was no innovation that ever happened. And what it took was Google Chrome coming out. Chrome came out, destroyed the, the, the presence of Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer basically vanished once Edge came out. There was a compelling event. 
So when I look at this, I think of Internet Explorer. Don't be Internet Explorer. This is the new way that Microsoft does our development. We have these small cycles. Now, what that gives you is a pattern that looks like this. Now, if there's churn, if there's, a, if there's a end of a tour and you have a new leadership coming in, well, the disruption isn't that big because you're continually developing and adding that, that value. So to answer the question about how do you handle um, you know, people coming in and out, well, if your sprint cycles and your continuous delivery of, de of value is at such a smaller scale, at a smaller time scale, that disruption, you may, you may lose one or two sprints, but that's a month. That's, hand, that's doable. But if you're having these six month, 12 month sprints and you lose one of those, that's extremely impactful. So one of the ways that we, incur, that we maintain these sprints is we have a thing called technical debt. So each individual developer has a metric. There's a, a, this is the formula, you have the total number of engineers and the total number of bugs that you can support on your product is that number times four. You cannot have more than four bugs per developer on your team. And if you do, then you do not get any new features. You will have to spend your entire sprint fixing bugs. So what that does is it forces your developers to not only develop new products, but they have to also be testing it so they don't have bugs, because if they only spend their cycles fixing bugs, they can't release new features, which means they don't get you know, whatever their, their value that they're trying to deliver to their customer. We have a dashboard. I know it looks really terrible up on here, but basically what it's saying is we capture you know, how many, and this is a little bit better view, how many bugs each developer has assigned to them. And if they're green, that means they're under that threshold. If they're orange, that means they're above. And if they're red, they're way over that. And that way we can track and say, hey, you know, this, this developer right here, he's writing these features. And because a bug got put against that feature, it's now assigned to him directly. You know, maybe we need to talk with that individual and say, hey, you know, how do we make it so that your, your coding or your development, your product deployment is not getting as many bugs pushed out? And that comes back to one of my favorite things. You get what you measure. So these are some of the things that we measure at Microsoft. And these are some of the things we don't measure at Microsoft. Uh, we do not measure lines of code. We do not measure burn down. Going back to the, my, my example at the very beginning, when I was a, a GS5 working in the help desk in the, G, in the, in the G6 shop, in the J6 shop, um, I had less closed tickets than the other people because I was automating everything and I was, I was fixing a bunch of them. Well, the moment that I was said, hey, you know, your ticket number is down, what do you think happened? I think the best way to describe it is from one of my, my favorite Dilbert cartoons. I changed the script to create a new issue per computer that I fixed. And then I went from closing 10, 15 tickets a day to closing hundreds per day. You get what you measure. Too bad they didn't put a, you know, a, a bounty on, on the closed tickets, you know, I would have, I would have I would have done, well, yeah, I probably would have got a new minivan with my ticket closing. So we have an engineering scorecard, and one of the things that's important about our scorecard is it is not something that is used on performance. Performance being compensation. So, you know, you know Microsoft is a commercial company. We get bonuses. We get pay increases. That's tied to some sort of a metric. These scorecards are not tied to your performance metrics. And that is on purpose. Because that means that the values that are put in here are honest. Because if you know that if you have a, a, a red square and that's gonna financially impact you, that's gonna drive a certain motivation. But if you know that that red square isn't going to drive you financially, but professionally or maybe give you an honest reflection on what you're actually doing so that you can meaningfully change, 
Well, that's a culture change, and that is something that had to be agreed upon. These scorecards do not impact your end of year discussion with your manager. Rather, it impacts your, your sprint discussion with your dev lead and how you can perform better. That, that makes these numbers impactful. That makes them honest. And that was one of the things that we had to do. You get what you measure. And what you want to measure is how you can contribute more value to your end customers. Uh, zooms in a little bit. Um, here's a little bit about the release flow. Um, I won't go into that because we're at time. But I just want to talk about this. So when we talk about DevOps, everyone focuses on how do we go agile with our development? How do we, how do we have these sprint cycles on deploying new features? But I never hear anyone talk about how do we use DevOps to improve the actual process that we use to deploy code? How do we, how do we improve our delivery of value to our customers? And the way that you do that is you apply the same principles of DevOps to your DevOps process. You reflect on what you did right. You try to change what you did wrong. You try things. If it doesn't work, you don't do them again. You innovate on your own personal process. Maybe the sticky notes work for you. Maybe your organization, if you tried sticky notes, it would be a complete failure. How would you know unless you tried it? Iterate on your, per, your process as well as your software. These are some of the things that we did before. These are some of the things we did. And some of it's working great. Some of it needs improvement. And the process is evolving every time we release new software. Now I have one more video to close out um, because, you know, just like with the opening video with the, um, with the Formula One race car, you're not 100% on their first try. And neither were we. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to stay after and come and grab us. And uh, all right, thank you so much.